Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming along to the uh, first 3CL seminar of Lent term. And I'm uh, delighted to introduce Professor Irene Lynch Fannin from University College Cork in Ireland. Uh, just to tell you a small bit about uh, Professor Lynch Fannin, uh, she's a graduate of University College Dublin, Oxford University, and the University of Virginia. And she qualified as a solicitor in 1985. Uh, having trained in Dublin and practised in London. Uh, Irene has published extensively in a number of areas, uh, particularly corporate insolvency law and also corporate governance and employment law. And uh, in addition to commenting on current matters related to corporate and personal insolvency, Professor Lynch Fannin maintains an interest, a strong interest in comparative corporate governance and regulation. Uh, and within, uh, certainly within the corporate law sphere, she's most well known for her uh, uh, very influential and excellent book, Working Within Two Kinds of Capitalism, which deals essentially with the crossover between corporate law, particularly corporate governance, and also labour law and labour relations. Uh, and it's uh, in the corporate law sphere that uh, Irene will be speaking this afternoon. Uh, her paper's titled From Genius to Quackery, Corporate Law Theory and Boards, which we're excited to hear more about. Uh, Irene will speak for roughly about half an hour and then the rest of the session up until 2pm will be reserved for questions. Uh, Irene has also pointed out she will be happy to accept interruptions, which may be a uh, dangerous move, <laughs> but feel free. Irene has, has given you licence to interrupt if you wish during her talk, so without further ado. Okay, Thank um, thanks very much, Mark. And I just want to thank Mark for extending the invitation to me to come here. Now, I should explain that um, the last time I was really interested in comparative corporate law theory, as Mark has mentioned, was when I published the book Working Within Two Kinds of Capitalism, which I think in retrospect was probably misnamed because it's really about corporate law theory um, comparing US and EU corporations and how <coughs> employees are considered as stakeholders. But anyway, that was published in 2003 and after that um, I uh, in about uh, became got more interested again in insolvency law because of the economic situation and um, had a stint in management and so I'm now coming back to corporate law theory but the first time I met Mark was I think the last SLS and he was giving a paper and I intervened and he said oh are you Irene Lynch Fannin? And I thought for the first time in my life, he expects me to be dead, I think, or, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> or something. And no, so, no, it, was just a, it was just a rock star name. <laughs> well, I think it's only you that think I'm a rock star name, actually. So anyway, um, uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. So this is, I'm revisiting uh, corporate law theory. I've just come back to teaching from a year of sabbatical leave. And so this paper, which is nearly finished, and the discussion today is really generated from some reading I managed to do um, while I was on sabbatical, and particularly in the last bit of it, which was at, as a visitor at Oxford Law Faculty. So um, as a uh, is said the title is from genius to quackery and I've referred to the work which I'm my own work which I'm sort of reflecting back on um, just in the first slide so just to get started the um, purpose of the paper is to uh, rethink corporate law theory in terms of um, the time I've had to reflect on it and to examine certain kinds of initiatives which have been passed or legislated for recently, um, particularly as they affect directors. Um, um, so the focus is on the regulation of corporate directors and also on internal corporate governance matters. So the starting point is the use of this term genius. 
um, which is generated from a book written by Professor Roberto Romano called The Genius of American Corporate Law, um, where she had been asked as a task to consider the role of Delaware as the provenance of corporate law in the United States in the light of a sort of a creeping federalism or federal regulation of corporate law in the United States. Um, and she uh, described what was the genius of corporate law and particularly Delaware corporate law um, in that book. Um, in contrast then, she also uh, used this term quack corporate governance to criticise certain kinds of legislative initiatives um, which uh, were implemented post particular kinds of crises. So as you can see, she wrote an article in relation to the Sabrina-Oxley Act. Um, but this term, quack corporate governance, has been used by other writers, including Stephen Bainbridge, who, um, with whom I have in common the fact that we were both mentored by, by Professor Mike Dooley at the University of Virginia. And interestingly, most recently, it's been used by Luca Enriquez, who I believe has been here recently and teaches here sometimes, um, to describe uh, the regulation of directors under the new EU bank regulation. So that is the, uh, de is describing the provenance of the title. So from Romano's analysis, the characteristics of the genius of corporate law um, are as follows. Firstly, from her point of view as an American writer, the idea that the regulation is state-based and the importance of Delaware as opposed to federal regulation, which doesn't necessarily have any real comparator um, in the UK or in Europe, except perhaps regarding a drive towards harmonisation. But more importantly, the genius of corporate law for her is that it is a, an enabling kind of legal framework that it relies on private ordering of relationships within the corporation, that it is responsive um, to commercial realities. This includes everything from the ease of incorporation to the responsiveness of the um, commercial bar and the courts. Um, also, part of uh, Romano's description is that the Delaware court is responsive, the, ju the judges are commercially astute, um, specialised, as is the bar. Now, one um, characteristic that I've also added, which, to be fair, I don't think Romano really gets into, is the idea that uh, part of the genius of corporate law is that it relies on broad-based principles rather than specific codification. And that's something that's quite dear to my heart because we have in Ireland actually now embarked on a codification of director's duties, which in my view is misguided um, in the same way that Section 172 might be, in my view, misguided also. Um, just to digress a little bit, when Roberto Romano was writing in 1993, Ralph Winter in the introduction to the book made these following points, because this was considered to be a watershed moment at that time in the development and evolution of corporate governance and corporate law theory. Um, so firstly, he noted that we have now realised at that time that economic analysis could add to our understanding of corporate law. And I don't think anybody could argue with that, but um, I want to bring that a little bit forward now. Um, he also recognised that it is possible when we are using particular kinds of theory to analyse corporate law that we can move from one kind of theory to another. Um, and then finally... There was a view at this point that the concern with a race to the bottom, which was the concern about the use or the location of Delaware as a focus of regulation, as distinct from federal regulation, was overstated. And I think that's important in the European context. But to go back to point one and two, one of the things that is interesting to me and that I want to develop on as I develop this project is that the economic analysis of corporate law has relied on a particular kind of economic theory. 
Um, and economic theory is also now changing and behavioral economics is becoming much more dominant in terms of how economists look at issues. Whereas to me, it looks like the corporate lawyers are still stuck with the rational wealth maximization type of economic analysis. And it has always seemed to me that that is a pretty impoverished view of economics um, and also um, how corporate lawyers have used economic theory. So um, there's this actually, by the way, great article written by Charles Schwab about uh, it's entitled Coase, Why Lawyers Listen and Economists Do Not. Um, so the point is that there's more than one economic theory and we can always change. So that's a by the way point. The characteristics of quackery, um, <coughs> as far as Romano, Bainbridge and others are concerned, is the idea that fe federal regulation would uh, become more dominant over the Delaware corporate law approach to corporate law. There's a possible comparator here with EU harmonization. Uh, but more specifically, uh, the characteristics of quackery um, assume that one kind of regulation fits all kinds of corporate situations. It tends to be prescriptive. It tends to be specific and rule-based. Um, it therefore is not flexible and limits adaptability. It also tends to have a knee-jerk or reactive quality in that you will often find these quack pieces of legislation are enacted to respond to particular crises because there's public pressure to respond. And for that reason, this kind of specific rule-based <coughs> legislation can sometimes be meaningless um, in terms of the overall framework of corporate law. Sometimes it can be repetitive in the sense that it actually repeats in specific ways rules and principles which we already have. And sometimes it can be just in its character unenforceable. Okay. So there are three examples of quackery that I'm picking on in this particular paper. And they really are just examples from which I can develop the discussion. Um, so the first are, say, on pay initiatives. The second, which I will be focusing on, is about the regulation of independence of directors. And the third, which caused me a bit of problem, a few problems when I gave this talk at Oxford, is Section 172 of the Companies Act. Um, and um, having listened to the comments there, I'm willing to acknowledge that not all of these are similarly egregious in terms of being quackery, um, but certainly the regulation of the independence of directors is something we can uh, think about. Um, just by the way, I'm very interested in uh, the EU initiative which mandates quotas for women on boards of corporate, on corporate boards. And that, I think, from a corporate governance point of view, is also an example of quackery. But there are other good reasons why we should have those quotas, which um, you can ask me about later. So, regulation of independence as an example of quackery. What's wrong with it? Um, so, I'm going to focus on the EU Capital Requirements Directive, which is one of the latest pieces of legislation that we have in relation to requiring independence of corporate directors in relation to banks. Um, but it is part of a family of legislative initiatives which require independence of directors. But the wording of Article 9 of the EU Capital Requirements Directive is just a very good example of this kind of legislation. So it requires that directors of European banks must possess at all times sufficient knowledge, skills and experience to perform their duties. And then it goes on to say that they must have honesty and in integrity and independence of mind to effectively assess and challenge the decisions of the senior management where necessary. Um, and so it is, as I say, of a piece with other kinds of regulation that you will find in other corporate law systems around the world. 
And I'm referring here to Lemire and Gilligan's survey of those kinds of requirements that has been published in the JCLS. Um, and also Luca Enrique's article um, on this, which has been just published on, in Theoretical Inquiries in Law. <clears throat> so just looking at the independence re requirement, um, and considering the trouble and the problems with this kind of quack regulation or legislation. This is a knee-jerk uh, populist response to the current crisis. In other words, the financial crisis generated a lot of public dismay. There is some requirement to be seen to be doing something about this. And so we are deciding that what we need are independent directors in relation to bank boards. And we are going to make sure that these directors are independent. And so the laws are drafted uh, with that in mind. It's very prescriptive. It is requiring directors to specifically exercise independence of mind to effectively challenge <laughs> management. And it undermines the genius of corporate law because it ignores the broad principles which we already have in relation to directors' obligations and tries to have very specific rules which in my, to my mind, add very little to what we already have. Um, and it also then, because it is meaningless and unenforceable, generates, to my mind, what I call rule of law issues. And so interestingly, in their article, Enriquez and Zeche say, you know, they conclude that the best way to deal with this is to encourage EU member states not to enforce this. So we have implemented the legislation, but the answer is let's just have a sort of a soft approach to enforcement. When you have commentators deciding. Can you say only enforceable there? I mean, I can't, I've, I've read in the newspaper, I can't yeah. remember. Um, uh, some of the time, what they didn't do was to look at the extent to which what's in CRD4 was already to be found in the kind of national um, sectoral regulation. Mm. Mm. So the, what we're dealing with is not a matter of corporate law. We're dealing with the uh, issue of uh, financial regulation and that CRD4 is about a package of measures yeah. to stabilise the finance sector yes. and would be overseen and enforced <coughs> by financial regulators. Yes, yeah. So so, I don't. I think there is quite. A, there was certainly in the UK quite a lot already with respect to oversight yeah. of senior management yeah. and yeah. Of yeah. banks yeah. and other financial institutions. Yeah. That was quite um, uh, as a, as a rigorously used mm. by the supervisor. Yeah. Um, and so in that sense, the fact that it has not been upgraded to an EU-wide uh, sort of harmonised requirement maybe isn't so odd. We look yeah. at it from a financial yeah. perspective, and yeah. actually this enforced, or <coughs> capable of being enforced by financial agencies. Yeah, but what I mean by being unenforceable is just literally the terms of the regulation that we are asking directors to have independence of mind to effectively challenge um, direct to management. So my view is just simply on the wording. How can you enforce the independence of someone's mind? My view would be that um, this will become a sort of a compliance box ticking kind of uh, regulation enforced on the basis of evidence that yes we did challenge senior management my point is just in a theoretical deep kind of way that this really does not add anything to what we have understood that directors are already obliged to do in relation to their duties of supervision and monitoring of management in any event and so these this kind of legislation it's not the elevation to the eu directive it is actually the content of the rule whether it's eu domestic or whatever that it is very difficult to explore 
the state of mind of a particular director to ask whether he or she has the sufficient independence. So to my mind, the quackery aspect to this is piling more law onto existing law and adding nothing. And certainly to from what I have understood from people when they sort of express are they, are they worried about this? You ask them, they say, oh no, we just say, yes, I did, ch I did exercise independence of mind, that it will be just a tick box compliance mechanism and therefore unenforceable. And interestingly, just in their article, um, Enrique Sanzeche, they, they, in a way, sort of despair. They throw up their hands and say, well, look, you know, the answer is to have sort of a, um, a, a soft implementation of this. And my concern about the genius of corporate law is that when you get to that point in terms of having a response to particular kinds of corporate law, that does undermine the rule of law and it undermines the credibility of a corporate law framework if respected commentators are recommending that this is the appropriate response. So anyway, uh, then going to other corporate law theories such as Stephen Bainbridge, Stephen Bainbridge's um, view of the, our focus on director's independence um, is that he describes it as a fetish, you know, that we think that independent directors are going to be the answer to everything, and he highlights at least three problems with directorial independence, which make, to my mind, common sense, or, or are common sense, that uh, you have an informational asymmetry between really outside independent directors and inside management. In other words, if you look at the global financial crisis, you wonder what happened, you wonder about the role of independent directors, and there are just so many questions to be asked as to wh what questions they asked, what answers were given, and how that informational gap caused so quite a lot of difficulties. There's also, according to Bainbridge, the loss of value of insider rep representation. Now, I'm not sure that that is the same as institutional knowledge in his analysis, but certainly we can add that. And then he goes on to say that insider representation on the board provides the board with a credible source of information necessary to accurately assess managerial performance. So, <clears throat> about independence particularly, um, there are those issues. So in relation to this kind of legislation, um, as it is directed at directors, the next part of my paper goes back to corporate law theory. Um, and I think this paper is more than one, I think it's more a project really. Um, it goes back to corporate law theory to ask and consider what directors really do to consider what we're trying to do when we're regulating directors. So I'm going back to Stephen Bainbridge's analysis, and he uh, analyzes corporate law theories um, in this paper here, which I've referred to, but also in a later book, which he published post the crisis in 2012. And he makes a distinction between corporate law theories which focus on shareholder primacy and his own theory which focuses on director primacy. And I find his analysis quite compelling and certainly well worth a read um, if you have not looked at his work before. But in this area, I think my view is that corporate law um, is much better explained by a focus on directorial primacy. But I have two points of disagreement with Bainbridge. The first is that he makes a lot of play about distinguishing this from managerialism, this focus on director primacy. Um, and in my view, that's overplayed. I think in reality, uh, in most companies, management and directors are closer. Um, and so we might consider the exercise of managerial decisions and directorial primacy as the same thing, reflecting the same practical issue in company law as it is lived and as it is often adjudicated upon. <clears throat> 
The second point that I am developing in relation to my view now of corporate law theory is that a lot of the theories focus on shareholder wealth maximization. And for somebody like me, who I suppose would be a bit left of centre in terms of what I'm trying to consider corporate law is trying to achieve, my view is that shareholder wealth maximization is not actually the driving force behind corporate law theory, but a view of corporate wealth enhancement. That the focus on shareholder primacy and shareholder wealth maximization has led us um, into the difficulties in which we find ourselves now. Okay. So, um, in terms of directorial primacy, just to give you some ideas in terms of food for thought as to why this might be the better view of what corporate law is about. Um, just to point out to you that the way directors decide matters and strategy in companies is not always aligned specifically to the interests of shareholders in reality. And as you know, directors owe their duties to the company, not to the shareholders. In particular, directors have to deal with issues of risk which are open-ended, unlike shareholders, whose <coughs> risk is quantifiable even the downside. Okay. Directors have risks of liability, risks now increased um, with the risks that they encounter in relation to compliance with the general legal framework which affects companies. And Mark's book, um, Corporate Governance in the Shadow of the State, really grapples with very effectively with the public law nature of corporate regulation. And it raises the issue as to what, well, I shouldn't really, uh, it raises this point as to the nature of, of corporate law, is it public or private or this issue? And so the point here, just briefly, is that directors because they're acting on behalf of the corporation, have a lot of compliance issues which are of no concern to shareholders specifically. Moving on then, directors preside over corporate assets. They have to deploy corporate assets for lots of different reasons. And so their decisions have implications for other stakeholders, um, which uh, it, again <coughs> underlines the fact that they're decision-making is not always aligned to shareholders. So again, just a word about my corporate wealth enhancement idea. I think this is also a better fit with corporate law as it is lived and as we really see it happening both in um, judicial decisions and in the development of corporate law. If you look at the idea if you consider the idea that directors must enhance corporate wealth rather than shareholder wealth, this reflects the corporate entity theory. It reflects how we think of stakeholders. And so even though I'm critical of Section 172, I think 172 is trying to encapsulate this idea also. This is not a stakeholder theory. In other words, this is not an argument to say that shareholders and stakeholders are equally treated, but it is just an acknowledgement of the idea that directors, when they're making decisions, think of other issues on a day-to-day -day basis, or managers and directors, other than maximising <coughs> shareholder wealth. In addition, it fits, in my view, better with Bainbridge's director primacy theory, which I'm also interested in. It moves us away from short-termism, which is a good thing. And in my view, it reflects long-term shareholder expectations. I'm thinking of shareholders who invest in corporations as a wealth-generating strategy for themselves. Okay. So putting these theoretical statements together, just to sum up in relation to where we're going in terms of regulating directors in particular, 
um, I've set up this dichotomy between the genius of corporate law. So in that sense, I suppose I have to confess I'm a traditionalist in some ways, as distinct from quack legislation, which are specific um, knee-jerk responses. I think there's a very strong argument to be made, which has already been made in part by Bainbridge, that the functions of corporate law really support an idea of directorial primacy, not shareholder primacy, which is different from an awful lot of theories at the moment. My own view, I think... Um, this development of uh, this idea that directors really are motivated by enhancing corporate wealth, not shareholder wealth maximisation, answers a lot of problems which we have seen in recent years. And finally then, I am also proposing that normally company law is about supporting the authority of directors rather than rendering directors accountable um, on an ongoing basis. Okay. So just lastly, the last bit of this theoretical framework that I'm building is that we have been obsessing in the last 10, 20 years about accountability mechanisms for directors. But if any of you who are students of company law, if you think about it, a company law course, if you like, is often concerned with these accountability mechanisms. We focus on them a lot. But that is because, in my view, they are the exceptional parts of company law. In other words, it's when these things become litigated that we develop an interest in them but most of the time when we look at these accountability mechanisms most of us realize they're not that effective so we talk a lot about um well they're not it's not that they're not effective but they are not they are exceptional in terms of the normal day-to-day -day living of the corporate law framework. So we know that directors' duties are very difficult to enforce. We know that shareholders' actions are very rare. We know that derivative actions are almost impossible. Um, and we also, well, certainly I would have a lot of doubts about the efficient capital markets hypothesis, just to mention a few. And so the argument here is that actually a lot of corporate law is about supporting directorial authority. So that is the last um, theoretical point. So where I'm going with this is that on reflecting on corporate law theory and using these various commentators which I've talked about, that there's quite a focus and support for directorial discretion. Um, and the question then is, um, how does this work in reality um, in terms of generating corporate wealth and supporting uh, good decisions? And my argument is that if we understand that one of the primary functions of corporate law theory is to support directorial discretion, we can then go about managing and uh, persuading or influencing the kinds of decisions that directors make in appropriate ways. And I suppose the crux for me is that all of the theoretical discussions up until the point of the financial crisis did not seem to generate anything that prevented that happening. Now, that said, some people will say, okay, well, that isn't really what happened. That's not the cause but to, of the global financial crisis. But to me, the risk-taking that was involved um, is certainly something which indicates a failure of corporate governance and corporate law theory. Just to finish off, I have mentioned some examples of cases where the courts are very clearly supporting the idea that directors need to have discretion to uh, decide about corporate wealth and the uh, use of corporate assets. Yeah. How is the Archon Ford Motor Company case? Because there they struck down what Ford wanted to do. 
I thought that they ha didn't strike down what Ford wanted to do. I think that he wanted to that they hadn't that he they claimed dividends, but that they reached a settlement with them. He lost. He tried. He, he tried to do what he wanted to do, and they ruled the favor of the shareholders. That case was a quintessential shareholder primacy case. I don't well, um, I've, I always, I've misunderstood what the case was about. I thought that the Dodge brothers sued for non-payment of dividends. Yeah, they and and they I thought they settled it. Well, in court, but they yeah. won that case. They did won. they? Yeah. Okay, well, we have to take that off the list then. Yeah, it, it would be the one case that would go the other. It, it is the quintessential shareholder privacy case. Yeah, okay, sorry, my mistake. I've always thought it went, that it was set, that, that, that he supported the investment in River Rouge. No, they told Ford he couldn't do what he wanted to do. Okay, well, we'll take that out of the list then. The exception that proves the rule, maybe. Yeah, well, we just <laughs> take it off the list. I, 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 I mean, I would use Paramount. That, yeah, Paramount yeah. Paramount is the case. Yeah, sure. The best case, Paramount. Yeah, yeah. So that's good. Yeah. The Paramount's the yeah. essential. Okay. Yeah. Home run directors can do what yeah. they want, yeah. even in the face of massive yeah. shareholder gain. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Um, okay. So then, just another part of the project for me is then what should guide this discretion? So, if we have a space in corporate law that, provide, that allows directors to have this discretion, um, what does guide them? Um, and how can we influence it? And the the point for me is, if we can get to a better understanding of what corporate law is about, we will have a better chance of making sure that um, we have discretionary decision making that um, is perhaps safer, not in all cases, but also better in terms of generating wealth. So one of the things that I am interested in is the analysis that is derived from norm scholarship. So we've quite a, few, a number of writers in the, um, they're mostly American writers in the area of norm scholarship, and I've provided a list. But the discussion here is about what judges do when they are deciding these kinds of cases in relation to directorial decisions. And so it's also true here, and certainly in, in jurisprudence in Ireland, that when uh, judges are talking about what directors are doing or the decisions that they have made, whether it's taking risks or continuing to trade or um, doing things which, particularly in the United States and Delaware, shareholders challenge. The courts a lot of the time consider legal principles, apply them where necessary, but also say a lot about what Ju Chancellor Chandler has called aspirational standards of best practice. And so this idea that quite a lot of the time the courts are giving guidance to directors, to my mind, is quite an attractive proposition, that we are setting the parameters and guidance for what um, directors should do without addressing issues of legal compliance or legal liability. So this quote from Edward Rock I quite like, um, called, from an article called Saints and Sinners, How Does Delaware Corporate Law Work? He says here, my claim here, which is descriptive, is that the Delaware courts generate in the first instance the legal standards of conduct, largely through what can best be thought of as corporate law sermons. So that um, there's a lot of guidance being given without necessarily much decision in relation to legal liabilities or some decision in relation to legal liabilities, but a whole area of um, norms which are described. And so the proposition is that corporate law is designed with director primacy in mind, with acknowledgement that directors have a, a considerable amount of discretionary decision-making authority. What's motivating this is the enhancement of corporate wealth um, and the way that this can be influenced in a normatively positive way has been through the way the courts have dealt with issues of liability and with the statements that are also made by the judges, by the courts, when they are considering particular issues. Um, so that is, the, I suppose, where I'm at at this point.